John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave While weep the sons of bondage whom he ventured all to save But though he sleeps his life was lost while struggling for the slave His soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah Welcome to War of the Rebellion, Stories of the Civil War. I am your host, Leon, and this is a reading of the regimental history under the Maltese Cross Antietam to Appomattox. The Loyal Uprising in Western Pennsylvania, 1861 to 1865, Campaigns, 155th Pennsylvania Regiment, narrated by the rank and file. We are on Chapter 16, Five Forks, Appomattox, Part 2. General Warren removed from command. April 2nd, 1865, the announcement was made in general orders that Petersburg had fallen, the news, though expected by the troops, being received with acclamations and great demonstrations of joy. While still felicitating themselves over the joyful announcement, the astounding news came that General Warren had been removed by General Sheridan from the command of the Fifth Corps at the moment of victory at Five Forks. The information seemed incredible. The 155th and all the troops of the Fifth Corps were shocked and indignant at this action, and for hours following were scarcely able to credit the news, attributing the report to baseless camp rumors. The announcement, however, proved to be only too true. Without detracting in the least from the fame of General Sheridan and his brave troopers, The fact stands out clear and uncontradicted in the history of that period that it was the brilliant generalship of General Warren and the courageous fighting of his invincible infantry corps that consummated the fall of the Confederate capital and rendered the glory of Appomattox a certainty. And just at the supreme moment, when the glorious news that liberty and self-government were once more triumphant was encircling the globe on the wings of the lightning, when the bells were ringing and bonfires blazing over the joyful tidings throughout the North, General Sheridan, with authority from General Grant, removed General Warren. For sixteen years, General Warren knocked yearly at the doors of the government for a court of inquiry, and it was not granted until the presidency of Rutherford B. Hayes. It was in vain that he appealed to the authorities in Washington after his arbitrary removal from the command of the Fifth Corps and the failure to prefer charges of any kind against him for a court of inquiry. Under President Hayes' administration, a commission of major generals of the United States Army was appointed as a court of inquiry. General Hancock was detailed for service in the court, but was soon afterwards nominated for the presidency and was obliged to withdraw from the service. This declination of General Hancock, it was said, greatly affected General Warren at the time because of his great faith and confidence in Hancock's sense of justice. General George A. Custer, commanding a division of cavalry, side by side with General Warren, in his report of the battle, paid the highest tribute to the energy, ability, and soldierly qualities exhibited by Warren in the action. General Charles Griffin and General Roman B. Ayers, in official letters, furnished soon after the event, bore testimony to General Warren refuting the insinuations that he had left anything undone in cooperating with General Sheridan. General S.W. Crawford, the division commander, and General Richard Coulter were witnesses at the Court of Inquiry and testified from their personal observations at commanders in the battle to the great valor, distinguished gallantry, and intrepidity of General Warren at Five Forks, and to the further fact that the division, commanded by General Crawford and led by Warren, had sustained more loss and killed and wounded in the action of Five Forks than did the divisions of Griffin and Ayers, with whom Sheridan was present. They furthermore, in official reports, certified to the capture of several thousand Confederate prisoners and numerous stands of colors of the enemy. After months of deliberation, the Court of Inquiry completely exonerated General Warren from blame of any kind, while conceding the discretionary right and power vested in General Sheridan to remove Warren with or without cause. As the 155th, somewhat strung out and scattered by the underbrush and other obstructions, 
advanced, they suddenly came upon the enemy's field hospitals, where the Confederate surgeons were dressing their wounded. Pushing forward, the regiment soon reached an open space in the rear of the enemy's works, but found their further progress intercepted by a ravine filled with bushes. The crossing of this depression caused more confusion in the ranks. And as the regiment climbed up the opposite bank, the men found themselves face to face with a strong column of Confederate reinforcements marching in the rear of their works. Before regaining their breath and forming into anything like a semblance of order, the regiment received a volley from the reinforced enemy which threw the troops into worse confusion, and caused them to fall back into the woods from which they had just emerged. Major Klein, who had command of the regiment, gallantly rode among the boys and quickly rallied them. Not waiting to regain his hat, which had been knocked off by an overhanging branch, the major bravely led the regiment in a renewed attack upon the enemy, which was made with such impetuosity that the Confederates in their front threw down their arms and surrendered. When the battle finally ended, it was found that the 155th had captured more prisoners than there were men in the regiment, besides three pieces of artillery and a number of caissons, army wagons, ambulances, etc., the regiment suffered severely in the action. Among the many casualties were Captain George P. McClelland, who commanded Company F into the engagement. He received a serious wound in the thigh, and was for half an hour a prisoner in the hands of the enemy. He was rescued, however, by the grand countercharge of the regiment. The captain's wound was deemed a mortal one, and he was removed to a field hospital and as tenderly cared for as the surrounding conditions would permit. To the surprise and pleasure of his comrades, Captain McClelland survived his injury, and after months of suffering, finally recovered sufficiently to return to the peaceful pursuits of civil life. Lieutenant Thomas B. Dunn of Company C was also badly wounded in the knee, from which he died a few hours later. It was his first appearance after being promoted to first lieutenant for gallant and meritorious services in many battles. He had just returned from home on a furlough and wore a new uniform presented to him by friends. General Pearson visited him in the field hospital, and urged Dr. Kitchen, the regimental surgeon, to do his best for the lieutenant, promising him a substantial reward if he could save the life of his wounded friend, but all without avail. The brave Sergeant Huey Park, of Company E, was wounded in the groin in this battle, finally dying of his wound years afterwards, he had escaped unscathed in all previous campaigns. During the half-hour interval between the first and the second charge by the 155th, several members of the regiment who were leading the advance in the first charge were captured by the enemy. Among those thus captured were Sergeant J.A. McDowell of Company F, and Solomon Durnell and Daniel Hawk of Company K, all of whom had exciting experiences until recaptured by the second charge of the regiment. Sergeant William Logan, who had been detailed from Company I for duty with the Corps Battalion of Sharpshooters, while with his detachment had a narrow escape from the capture by Pickett's Confederate Division in this action. The detail had been assigned to duty on the flank, and were very much exposed. When the battle was over, six sharpshooters were found killed, but the survivors all escaped capture. As a sequel to Major Klein's experiences, it may be mentioned that a few days later, at Appomattox, he discovered his lost hat on the head of a Confederate prisoner. On learning, however, that the Confederate had bought the hat from a fellow prisoner, who had found it at Five Forks, paying therefore $300 Confederate money, the gallant Major declined to reclaim the hat. On the morning following the Battle of Five Forks, when the rolls of the various companies were called, the missing were carefully sought for in the woods and grounds through over which the 155th had advanced in its wild rush. Among the missing was Sergeant Ashbury Seacrest of Company F. He and a Confederate soldier were found dead in the woods, lying feet to feet, each with a bullet hole in his forehead, both muskets empty. So far as known, no mortal eye witnessed that deadly combat. Only friend and foe and God were present. In the impetuous onslaught, they had met and both died. Sad and shocking as was the spectacle, the sequel was still sadder. Away back in Fayette County, Pennsylvania, both the aged parents of young Seacrest sickened and died with grief within a short period after hearing the sad tidings, the mother losing her reason before dying. That is the story of but one side, 
Had Sergeant Secret's Confederate antagonist a wife, mother, or father? His name never being known, there being nothing on his person by which he could be identified, did some trembling, hoping loved one in the sunny Southland watch and wait and pray in agony of expectation for the step and knock that would never be heard, and pine away for tidings no human being could ever bring? God knows. In the afternoon of the 2nd of April, 1865, the regiment marched in line of battle to the South Side Railroad, at a point about fifteen miles from Petersburg, and turning to the right marched in the direction of the fallen city until night set in, when their regiment went into bivouac, being satisfied that the news regarding the capture of Petersburg was correct. The doom of the fallen city was sealed, as the uninterrupted and incessant bombardment with the heaviest siege guns the entire night previous was bound to penetrate the weak spots in Lee's defenses. General Lee was soon made aware of the terrible disaster to his army at Five Forks. Its full significance was apparent to him. His right flank had been turned, and the Fifth Corps, now with Griffin as commander, was in his rear. The problem with Lee now was how he could hold on until he could provide for a retreat. News of Victories Pursuit of Confederate Army Breaking Camp, April 3rd 1865, the regiment marched in the direction of Richmond, but halted on announcement being made that Richmond also had fallen, and that the Confederate army, in a demoralized condition, was trying to escape to North Carolina. Then the Fifth Corps let itself loose, the 155th especially cheering itself hoarse. Within half an hour, the regiment and all brigades and division of the Fifth Corps were retracing their steps and starting on a long, arduous march to intercept the Confederate army. Sheridan was in the advance with his cavalry, and although he would have preferred his old Sixth Corps, yet requiring the support of infantry troops that could endure the fatigues of long, rapid marches, and whose fighting qualities could be depended upon, in the most critical emergency, he hesitated not a moment before selecting the Fifth Army Corps. Thus was initiated the first scene in the last act of the great tragedy, which had its commencement on the 12th of April, 1861, when the first Confederate shot was fired against Fort Sumter. The afternoon of April 4th, 1865, the Fifth Corps arrived at Jetersville at about the time the vanguard of Lee's army arrived at Amelia Courthouse, nine miles distant, and about the same distance from Burksville Junction. The Corps found Sheridan's cavalry entrenched in a slight line of rifle pits extending across the Richmond and Danville Railroad, and skirmishing with bodies of Confederate cavalry towards Amelia Courthouse and being greatly concerned, lest the Fifth Corps would not arrive in time. The Fifth Corps immediately occupied the cavalry works, and in a short time with pick and shovel, had them thick and high. The Union cavalry moved off to take care of the flanks and the outposts on the road to Amelia Courthouse. The next day, April 5th, the tired troops of the Second and Sixth Corps began to arrive, and the regiment felt that Lee was actually headed off in his retreat to Danville to unite with General Johnston. At the same time, General Ord, with the 24th Corps, was arriving at Burksville Junction. The next morning, April 6th at daylight, found two divisions of Union cavalry massed, saddled and bridled, in front of the works of the 5th Corps, one on each side of the road leading to Amelia Courthouse. A few minutes later appeared Generals Grant, Sheridan, Meade, Griffin, and the division commanders of the cavalry and of the 5th Corps, and possibly Generals Humphrey and Wright, all mounted. The scene was an unusual and notable one. A squad of Sheridan scouts approached on the gallop and made a report to Sheridan personally. From the gestures and pointing of these scouts, the troops in line assumed that General Lee's army was in endeavoring to pass to the westward of the position of the Fifth Corps. General Sheridan reported to General Grant, and after a very short consultation, a decision was reached. A few orders from General Grant, and then the cavalry bugles began to blow at each division. Each brigade, each regimental and each troop headquarters, all blowing at once. There was, quote, mounting in hot haste, unquote, as the cavalry moved out on the road to Amelia Courthouse. The Fifth Corps bugles immediately began sounding the general pack-up call, and the troops were soon in motion, still following the cavalry up the Amelia Courthouse, and, after a march of three miles westerly, were soon on the trail of Lee's army, which had evidently been marching all night. 
During the day's march, some 400 of Lee's disabled army wagons were passed. About the middle of day, heavy firing, on the right to the 5th Corps line, of march indicated that the 2nd and the 6th Corps, moved on a shorter line, had struck the Confederate army at Sailor's Creek. The battle lasted until evening, resulting in the capture of 6,000 Confederates, including nine general officers, many pieces of artillery, wagons, etc. The regiment, with the 5th Corps, marched in a circle that day following Lee's army 27 miles, and camped at night only nine miles in an air line from the starting point of the morning. April 7th, 1865 The regiment and the 5th Corps was on the march again at daylight in the neighborhood of High Bridge, where the 2nd Corps had been skirmishing with the rear guard of Lee's army. All day the 5th Corps followed Sheridan's cavalry, passing south of Lee's army through Prince Edward's courthouse, camping at night in the neighborhood of Pamplin's depot. At daylight on the morning of the 8th of April, the march was resumed, following Sheridan's cavalry at a rapid gait all day, reaching that evening Appomattox Depot on the Lynchburg Railroad, where the cavalry had captured four supply trains loaded with provisions intended for Lee's army. The cavalry boys had detached the four engines and were having their fun running them up and down the track, ringing the bells and tooting the whistles. <laughs> These sounds to the ears of the 155th seemed like a return to civilization. The 5th Corps crossed the track and passed on a couple of miles northwest, going into bivouac about 2 o'clock in the morning. Near Custer's cavalry was having a skirmish with Lee's advance guard. General Ord's 24th Corps reached Appomattox Depot shortly after the 5th Corps, and both these corps were now as squarely planted across Lee's path on the road to Lynchburg as they had been at Cheatersville. And the sentiment in the 155th now was that if Lee escaped on the morrow, it would not be through their lines. The Surrender of the Confederate Army April 9, 1865 too much worn out from exhaustive marches to cook or to eat, the weary 155th Regiment bivouacked at 2 o'clock a.m. this day, at the sides of the road, and before the regiment had rested or had time to make coffee, firing in front warned the command that the second scene in the last act of the great tragedy was about to be enacted. General Bartlett's brigade was at once formed in line of battle, and the 155th, now under command of Major John A. Klein, was ordered to the front. The Confederates, believing they were opposed by cavalry only, had already advanced to brush the latter aside and to continue their retreat. The firing became rapid as the cavalry gradually fell back. The commands came sharp and quick from the brigade commander, General Bartlett. Quote, 155th. Forward is skirmishers. On center. Take intervals. Deploy. Unquote. These movements, being quickly executed by the 155th, the skirmish line covered the entire front of Bartlett's brigade, which rapidly formed in line of battle. As the 155th now deployed as skirmishers, advanced, the Union cavalry parted and, turning to the right and left, rode off the field, uncovering the advancing infantry skirmish line of the regiment. The spectacle of the glittering arms and serried ranks of the Union infantry had all the effect of a stunning and unexpected blow to the Confederates, who immediately began to fall back through the village of Appomattox. The 155th skirmish line pressed closely on the rear of the Confederates, capturing on the road 77 men, the remnant of an Alabama brigade, and two pieces of artillery, which had been firing. Whilst the right of the 155th skirmish line, which extended a considerable distance along the ridge overlooking the village of Appomattox, was engaged, a mounted courier suddenly emerged from a wooded grove within the Confederate lines, bearing uplifted a small white flag of truce and galloped directly to the Union front, reaching the firing line occupied by the 155th. No attempt was made from the Union line to interrupt this messenger, bearing the emblem recognized in time of war as a cause for suspending fire. On reaching the skirmish line, the courier was received by Sergeant Major William Shore, who, by orders of Major Klein, of the 155th, commanding the skirmish line, conducted him to General J. L. Chamberlain, commanding the division. The Confederates were no doubt induced to send the flag of truce by the discovery a short time previous that instead of being pursued by the advance of cavalry, 
and that cavalry was the only force in their front, they were facing infantry. They were much astonished on the withdrawal of the Union cavalry to discover the whole Fifth Corps infantry in battle line advancing to the attack, and cutting off all chance of retreat by the line they had chosen. The arrival of the messenger with the flag of truce at General Griffin's headquarters, to which he had been forwarded by General Chamberlain, resulted in the immediate dispatch of Captain George M. Loughlin, aide-de-camp on General Griffin's staff, with orders to be delivered by him to Major Klein, commanding the regiment, on the advanced skirmish line, at once to cease firing. This extremely hazardous duty, Captain Loughlin promptly performed. The Confederates, however, through some misunderstanding, continued their firing at points along the line in disregard of their own flag of truce. Persisting in this, General Griffin, on receiving reports from Captain Lawlin that the Confederates were disregarding their own flag of truce by firing, ordered Captain Lawlin to return to the front and deliver an order to Major Klein to resume firing until the enemy ceased. In delivering these orders, Major Lawlin was exposed to a galling fire from the enemy. Finally, when the Confederates stopped firing, Captain Lawlin again delivered General Griffin's orders for the last time for the 155th to cease firing, which order was obeyed, and not a hostile shot on either side was afterwards exchanged. Death of Young Montgomery During these intervals of firing, the 155th had several killed and wounded, one of the saddest and most pathetic being that of Private William Montgomery of Company I, who, while loading and firing, was mortally wounded by a cannonball. The pathetic feature of this young soldier's death being that he had scarcely reached his fifteenth year, and had been in the service but a few months, his life being really sacrificed after a flag of truce was within the Union lines, and through which the Peace of Appomattox occurred. This young Pittsburgh's boy's life was undoubtedly the last sacrifice which was offered up to the Union cause in the Army of the Potomac. As the final orders to cease firing had been delivered on both sides but a few moments before the hostile shot ended this young patriot's life, and no further casualties occurred. Young Montgomery's last words were messages of love and affection to his mother, and the tender of comforting hopes that his injuries were not serious. He expired the following day while the paroling ceremonies were being enacted. A few disorganized Confederate regiments were unwilling to surrender and wanted to fight it out, truce or no truce. A magnificent spectacle was presented during the morning of April 9th, when Merritt's bugles sounded the charge, and a whole division of Union cavalry went thundering down on the South Carolinians, who, without officers, persisted in firing, guidons bending to the front, sabers gleaming, and the troopers cheering, Merritt's men soon captured the belligerent Confederates. Many of the 155th at this time were suffering from hunger and fatiguing marches. But never did more refreshing news come to any troops than the announcement which this flag of truce conveyed to the regiment. Hunger and exhaustion, however, were forgotten amid the universal joy. The position, occupied by the 155th on the skirmish line, was on a commanding ridge, from which the entire landscape, including the village of Appomattox, could be seen. The Confederate army was visible on both sides of the road, and the McLean mansion, where the negotiations between Grant and Lee were being conducted, was distinctly within the range of vision. It was a most advantageous position for the Union troops, had the negotiations for the surrender failed. When the terms had been satisfactorily arranged between Grant and Lee, and the latter finally rode back along the line of Confederate troops, he was greeted with immense demonstrations of joy by his men. The cheering, however, having a more joyful significance to the Union troops than it had on any previous occasion. Terms of Surrender Concluded The day was well advanced when the two armies settled down quietly to await the result of the peace negotiations between Generals Grant and Lee. When the negotiations were finally concluded, General Lee came down from the porch of the McLean house, mounted his heavy gray horse, and rode back to his army. A few minutes later, a Union staff officer came down and announced that the Army of Northern Virginia had surrendered. Shortly after this announcement, 
a Union battery, about 100 yards distant from the McLean mansion, began firing a salute. When immediately, a couple of aides came dashing down from the porch with orders from General Crant to stop the salute, saying that there must be no exultation over the fallen foe. General Grant wrote the following order of terms of surrender in the presence of General Lee and his chief of staff, Colonel Charles Marshall, namely, quote, Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia, April 9, 1865. General R. E. Lee, commanding CSA. General, in accordance with the substance of my letter to you of the 8th, I propose to receive the surrender of the Army of North Virginia on the following terms, to wit, Rolls of all the officers and men to be made in duplicate. One copy to be given to an officer or officers as you may designate. The officers to give their individual paroles not to take up arms against the government of the United States until properly exchanged. And each company or regimental commander sign a like parole for the men of his command. The arms, artillery, and public property to be parked and stacked and turned over to the officers appointed by me to receive them. This will not embrace the sidearms of the officers, nor their private horses or baggage. This done, each officer and man will be allowed to return to his home, not to be disturbed by United States authority so long as they observe their paroles and the laws in force where they may reside. Very respectfully, U.S. Grant, Lieutenant General. Unquote. General Lee, after reading the letter of General Grant, wrote the following. Quote, Headquarters, Army of Northern Virginia, April 9, 1865. General, I have received your letter of this date containing the terms of surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia, as proposed by you, as they are substantially the same as those expressed in your letter of the 8th. They are accepted. I will proceed to designate the proper officers to carry out the stipulations into effect. R. E. Lee, General. To Lieutenant General Grant. Unquote. General Lee's Farewell Order When General Lee entered his lines after the surrender, there was a continuous cheering as he progressed to his headquarters, from which he immediately issued the following general order. Quote, headquarters Army Northern Virginia, April 10, 1865. General Order No. 9 After four years of arduous service, marked by unsurpassed courage and fortitude, the Army of Northern Virginia has been compelled to yield to overwhelming numbers and resources. I need not tell the brave survivors of so many hard-fought battles, who have remained steadfast to the last, that I have consented to the result from no distrust of them. But feeling that valor and devotion could accomplish nothing that would compensate for the loss that must have attended the continuance of the contest, I determined to avoid the useless sacrifice of those whose past services have endeared them to their countrymen. By the terms of the agreement, officers and men can return to their homes and remain until exchanged. You will take with you the satisfaction that proceeds from the consciousness of duty faithfully performed, and I earnestly pray that a merciful God will extend you his blessing and protection. With an increasing admiration of your countrymen and devotion to your country, and a grateful remembrance of your kind and generous consideration for myself, I bid you an affectionate farewell. R. E. Lee, General. Unquote. Parole of General Robert E. Lee and Staff We, the undersigned prisoners of war, belonging to the Army of Northern Virginia, having been this day surrendered by General Robert E. Lee, C.S. Army, commanding said Army, to Lieutenant General U.S. Grant, Commanding Armies of the United States, do hereby give our solemn parole of honor that we will not hereafter serve in the armies of the Confederate States of America, or render aid to the enemies of the United States until properly exchanged in such a manner as shall be mutually approved by the respective authorities. Done at Amabanix Courthouse, Virginia, this ninth day of April, 1865. Signed, R. E. Lee, General. W. H. Taylor. Lieutenant Colonel and Assistant Adjutant General. Charles S. Venable, Lieutenant Colonel and Assistant Adjutant General. Charles Marshall, Lieutenant Colonel and Assistant Adjutant General. H. E. Payton, Lieutenant Colonel, Adjutant and Inspector General. 
Giles B. Cook, Major and Assistant Adjutant and Inspector General. H. E. Young, Major, Assistant Adjutant General and Judge Advocate General. Endorsement. The within-named officers will not be disturbed by the United States authorities so long as they observe their parole and the laws in force where they may reside. Signed, George H. Sharp, Assistant Provost Marshal General. As soon as General Lee returned to his troops and issued this general order, the Confederate General Gordon assembled the men of his corps and addressed them in a powerful speech, telling them they had done all that men could do, and now their duty was at their homes, to their mothers, sisters, wives, and children, and bloodshed and tears should cease. During this eloquent address of General Gordon, the tears streamed down his cheeks, and there was not a dry eye among the hardened veterans of his corps. General Gordon continued until his death a sincere and devoted citizen, and his influence was ever after always for the good of the country he had fought so hard to destroy. The Union officers, named by General Grant to carry the stipulations into effect, were Generals Gibbon, Griffin, and Merritt. General Lee, for the Confederates, appointed Generals Longstreet, Gordon, and Pendleton. The troops designated to remain to receive the surrender were General Gribbon, 2nd Division Infantry with Artillery, General Griffin, 3rd Division Infantry with Artillery, General Mackenzie, 1st Division Cavalry with Artillery. As the Union Army had started on the campaign, with but twelve days' rations, and that period having about expired, the Army supplies were about exhausted. General Grant, having ordered 30,000 rations to be furnished the Confederates, the supply was still further diminished. The other corps of the Union Army were, therefore, ordered back to Burksville Junction to receive food and forage by the railroad. By the morning of the 12th, the remaining troops designated to receive the former surrender were doing duty on both empty stomachs and empty haversacks. A small hand-printing press, having been found at one of the corps headquarters of the Union Army, the 10th and 11th of April were spent in preparing forms of paroles and making duplicate rolls. By the irony of fate, April 12th, the fourth anniversary of the firing on Sumter, was the day appointed for the ceremonies attending the former surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia. The Fifth Corps Receives the Formal Surrender By General Meade's order, the Fifth Corps, General Griffin in command, was designated to receive the formal surrender. General Griffin, having selected his former division, now commanded by General J.L. Chamberlain, to receive the arms and colors of the Confederates, recognized the latter's claim by reason of seniority to command the 3rd Brigade, which had been assigned to conduct the parade. For this purpose, Brevet Brigadier General Pearson, who had been the commander of that brigade for the final campaigns from Hatcher's run to the firing line at Appomattox, was temporarily assigned to the command of the 1st Brigade, resuming command of the 3rd Brigade on the homeward march and the final review of the Army of the Potomac, May 1865. The 3rd Brigade, thus honored, was formed entirely from the eight veteran regiments of Chamberlain's division as follows. The 155th Regiment, Pennsylvania. 20th Regiment, Maine. 32nd Regiment, Massachusetts. 1st Regiment, Michigan. 16th Regiment, Michigan. 83rd Regiment, Pennsylvania. 91st Regiment, Pennsylvania. 1 Company, 1st Maine Sharpshooters. At 9 a.m., April 12th, the 155th was relieved from its position on the skirmish line, which it had been occupying continuously since the morning of the 9th, and with the 3rd Brigade was drawn up on the right of the road leading into the village. Muskets loaded, and bayonets fixed. General Chamberlain and staff on the right of the line adjacent to the hamlet. The 1st Brigade, under Brevet Brigadier General Pearson, and the 2nd Brigade, Brevet Brigadier General E.M. Gregory, formed on the opposite side of the road, beyond the left of the 3rd Brigade, facing the prolongation of the 3rd Brigade. At 9.30, a half hour later, the silvery tones of the bugles brought the troops to attention, and soon the 1st Confederate Brigade made its appearance, marching through the village and along the road in front of the 3rd Brigade. When the head of the Confederate column reached the left of the 3rd Brigade, and directly opposite the 155th, 
their commander, gave the command, quote, Halt. Close up. Front face. Stack arms. Unsling cartridge boxes. Hang on stacks. Unquote. This being done, the command was given, quote, Right face. Forward. Counter march by file right. March. Unquote. And away they went, unarmed and colorless, back to their camp. As soon as this brigade, which it was learned was Evans' brigade of Gordon's corps, had departed, the troops of the 3rd Brigade, by orders of General Chamberlain, then stacked arms and took down the Confederate stacks, piling the muskets on the ground in their rear, muzzles outward. One Confederate brigade succeeded another all day long, continuing until nearly 5 p.m., and as S.W. Hill, a member of the 155th, who was present at these final ceremonies, expresses it, quote, There was no need to stop for lunch, as there was not a cracker nor a bean in the 3rd Brigade, General Grant's orders of 30,000 rations to the Confederates having exhausted the supplies of his own men, unquote. It was evident that the Confederates were much dejected, though there appeared an expression of relief on their faces as they marched away, and their depression may have been caused more by hunger and emaciation than by chagrin of defeat. Most of them acted in a soldierly manner, but occasionally one would display ill temper by peevishly throwing his cartridge box at the foot of the stacks instead of hanging it thereon. The color guards, having stacked their arms, the color bearers deposited their flag against their stacks, some of them with tears in their eyes bidding farewell with a kiss to the tattered rags they had borne through so many dangers, the scene during the day was pathetic in the extreme, and tears welled up in the eyes of many a seasoned veteran in the Union lines. When the last Confederate brigade had disappeared, there was a pile of muskets shoulder-high, which the army wagons soon hauled away. The Army of Northern Virginia, the pride of the Confederacy, the Invincible, upon which their hopes and faith had been reposed, had disappeared forever, existing thenceforth in memory only. The total number of Confederates who received paroles at Appomattox reached about 28,000, though less than half that number had arms to surrender. Between the opening of the campaign on the 29th of March and the 9th of April, more than 19,000 prisoners and 689 pieces of artillery had been captured. 28,000 hatless, shoeless famishing men were cast adrift by the collapse of the Confederacy, hundreds of miles from their poverty-stricken homes. While the low, hovering smoke of battlefields had lifted, yet the embers and ashes of war had left desolate the entire intervening region, and the outlook of these disheartened and penniless men was indeed cheerless. With the true American spirit of humanity, those of the Union soldiers who had any money freely and generously shared it with their former enemies, and many Confederates were assisted to reach their homes in the Southwest by way of northern railroads. In the words of a gifted writer, quote, for ourselves the war was over, Othello's occupation gone. Our thoughts were homeward. We had followed the flag through defeat, disaster and suffering, and now in victory so hard won we could not exult over a fallen foe. We were sure they would help upbuild our common country. We had captured their arms, their flags, and their hearts. In retrospect, how many who had tramped with us had fallen by the wayside? and sealing their devotion with their life's sacrifice, were denied participation in the consummation of the victory we had just witnessed. They had marched and sang with us, We'll hang Jeff Davis on a sour apple tree, as we go marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. And as we watched the last Confederate disappear, surely the shades of comrades gone before would unite with us in singing, Glory, glory. Hallelujah. There is peace in all the land, and from every town and hamlet, and every bereaved heart in the great Northland, would come the response. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. There is peace in all the land. There is peace. And with that, we will move on to the next chapter, Appomattox Incidents and Homeward March, next week. I would remind everyone we are now officially 
Not officially, not even close. But we're just, we're about halfway through our regimental history here. So we've got lots more to read. We still have a few more regular chapters. And then after that, we go into some personal stories written by men of each company in the regiment. So it's going to be very fun and interesting to get into. So stick around for that. So I got to tell you guys, because I have to tell somebody this. I woke up today at like three in the morning and I could just, I could feel something on my back. And I was like, oh, what is that? Like, oh, is that an itch? And I went to scratch it and a mouse jumped off my bag, ran across my bed, went into the corner of my room and disappeared through like a little tiny crack. So I bought a lot of mouse traps today. <laughs> uh, he didn't even say sorry. He just ran off. Luckily for me, the combination of being a Afghanistan veteran has taught me how to make pressure plate mouse traps. So <laughs> it's, you know, if there's one mouse, then there's a ton. So, you know, I'm currently going to war in my own house here. All right. So enough about <laughs> let's get on to our notes that I have. General Warren getting removed from command. Let's talk about really getting shafted by Sheridan in your moment of victory. And a lot of people have talked about it before. Sheridan was a jerk. Brilliant cavalry commander, but a jerk. Then the 155th making its grand counter charge. And all they could think of, every part that I'm reading is like, no, stop, the war is almost over. But, you know, they have to keep going, right, until the enemy surrenders. So all the casualties that are happening, like Lieutenant Thomas B. Dunn being killed in his brand new uniform, presented by his friends and family, only for him to die in it. It's just, ugh. I don't like it. But then you've got moments of hilarity with Major Klein finding his hat on a Confederate prisoner. I can only imagine his confusion and being like seeing that guy and being like, that's my hat. Then in that grand charge, uh, both of those soldiers being killed, locked in mortal combat, like shooting each other at the same time. And then his family dying afterwards. That's not just two casualties, right? We got to remember in every conflict, there are always more. The people at home have to suffer too. And in this case, it's mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters. It means the casualty count always extends beyond the battle in all sorts of different directions. However, the Union boys, ringing the bells and tooting the whistles on the train up and down the railroad line, must have been immense fun. And I imagine it was quite hilarious for everyone watching, too. Especially since those were the trains that Lee thought he was going to feed his troops with. But, man, I couldn't help but laugh. So the 155th kind of being everywhere where history is being made, I really appreciate that. <laughs> That's... Very great for a regimental history to be reading. So that part, as far as reading regimental history, for them to do that for us, is real solid. I do want to make a special note about young Montgomery. Private Montgomery. <sighs> Wounded by a cannonball. And having it not kill him immediately. That sucks. And he was only a kid, so he probably joined. They said he showed up. You know, he's a replacement. He was 14 years old. He just turned 15. Heartbreaking for his mom. So let's take this moment to remember his sacrifice. Because he gave the last full measure of devotion for our country, the United States of America. Hoorah, young Private Montgomery. And the South Carolinians wanting to fight it out, truce or no truce, and then getting an entire division of cavalry charged at them as a reward. That's, that's something. That's one way of saying, like, do you really want to keep fighting? Okay, here you go. And as far as Confederates 
stacking their arms and surrendering is uh, pretty much just what everyone talks about. I'm going to link, well, there's a lot of pictures in this, so I'm going to post a lot of pictures to the website. Come check it out, please. And on top of that, I'm going to throw in some links. So while you're looking at some of the pictures, you can maybe watch some stuff as well. I think I'm going to have some really interesting stuff for you. I know one is going to be a reenactment of the surrender that was done. And, you know, something that's similar from Battlefield Trust. Of course, we always got to throw them up there. They always have something that they've done. But with that, come check out the website, guys. I'm going to have I'm going to throw the pictures up from this chapter and also have some videos for you to watch. And that should be fun. That's at rebellionstories.com. If you haven't been to it yet, it will be posted in the show notes. I also put up on my website a donation link as requested, and you will find that right underneath the episode player on the website. All right, friends, I'll see you later. I'm getting out of here. I got a, I got a mouse problem to go take care of. Oh, my goodness. Have a great one. Bye-bye. Old John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave While weep the sons of bondage whom he ventured all to save But though he sleeps his life was lost while struggling for the slave His soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah Glory, glory, hallelujah Hallelujah, for his soul is marching on. John Brown was a hero, undaunted, true, and brave. And Kansas knew his valor when he fought her rights to save. And now, though the grass grows green above his grave, his soul is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. He captured Harper's Ferry with his 19 men so few And frightened old Virginia till she trembled through and through They hung him for a traitor, themselves a traitorous crew But a soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah John Brown was John the Baptist of the Christ we are to see Christ who of the bondmen shall the liberator be And soon throughout the sunny south the slaves shall all be free For his soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah That he heralded, he looked from heaven to view On the army of the Union With its flag red, white, and blue And heaven shall sing with anthems Or the deed they mean to do For his soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah
freedom Then strike while strike ye may The death blow of oppression In a better time and way The dawn of old John Brown Has brightened in the day And his soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah So oh.